and it just goes on further. And finally, they get enough majority. These pastors that were under him get enough majority and enough kind of press behind him that just recently they took him out as the head pastor of the church that he started, of the ministry that he built up with his own hands from nothing. They took him out of it and they dissolved all the churches. So my friend who was leading one of the churches underneath Mark Driscoll, they came to him and they said, look, all of you guys have an option. You can either assume the debt for the church building because they'd all bought buildings on loans because again, money was just pouring in from the ministry. So you can either assume that debt and call it whatever you want. You can't call yourself Mars Hill anymore. You have to just come up with a new church name and you're your own deal. You have to register the government as a separate church or you shut it down. You tell your people and your church goes somewhere else. That's your two options. I mean, it would have been radical enough had they just taken Driscoll out as the head leader, but to just kind of disperse the whole thing because they realized you took him out at the top. He's kind of this charismatic guy. He's the guy attracting everybody. A lot of these campuses, the pastor didn't even preach. They just had him on a TV screen. They had their own worship team. They realized like everybody is you're going to fall into debt. This thing is, so these churches have to be responsible for themselves now. And I remember when this whole thing came out, you know, like I said, I don't agree with everything that Mark Triscoll has taught. However, I've listened to some of his teachings and some of the stuff he has is really legit. It's very good. He's been a major force in kind of correcting the emerging church movement, which was going way too far to the left. Um, <laughs> And, and so I saw God using him in the midst of a big movement in the American church. And I remember when this happened, I kind of thought, my, and this is embarrassing, but it's true. My first thought was like, really? Really, we're going to take this guy out for talking meanly to people? That's why we're taking him out of his church position, of a church that he built? Like, why don't these other guys just leave? If you don't like working under this guy, just leave. Go to another church. It's just like, this is why we're going to take this guy out. I mean, if you read Martin Luther's works, if you read about his life, I mean, and you read about some of these other major church leaders, John Wesley's works, they were mean too. <laughs> they really were. They were way more mean than this guy. I mean, talk about verbal abuse. I mean, good Lord, the way he talked to some of the people underneath him, Luther and Wesley. And I mean, like I said, in Geneva, they're like arresting people that don't agree with you. And they're just saying he talks meanly and he's, you know, won't listen to people and he just runs them over. And that was kind of this initial response. And I realized, wow, I have taken on so much of our current church culture. And that church, current church culture is that generally we don't discipline squat. We really don't. Like pastors can go and sleep with prostitutes. They can rip money off of the church. And as long as they come out with a big repentance statement, you know, they can get up and read that repentance statement. I did not have sex with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. And that little tear, little crocodile tear comes out. You know? Oh, okay. We forgive you, Pastor Bubba. You can stay as the pastor of our church. I mean, seriously. We, I mean, it would take something horrific to shock us in the next church scandal of what Pastor so-and-so did because it's just normal now. Oh, they were caught in adultery. or they were, I mean, a pastor has to really do something really outrageous before we're shocked anymore. And generally, we just kind of, we say the same thing. We just want to extend grace. And I understand that. As a school leader, I have been involved in countless decisions in YWAM. What do we do with this student? And I could almost predict in my mind how the meeting was going to go. Let me line up my grace staff. Okay? So I got my grace staff over here. They're always like champion of the losers. Right? They're the champions of the diamond in the rough. They're the ones who always want to extend grace. Like, we just need to give them another chance and another chance and another chance. And then I would have over here the death squad. Right? I have over here the ones that are like the Joshua generation. 
Like, let's take him out to the Valley of Acor and get busy. <laughs> Stone him. <laughs> They're just ready to pull the trigger. They're just waiting for a good reason to boot this student out because they don't deserve to be here. Or, and again, you probably, all the staff are looking at each other like, yep, 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 mm -hmm, this time, yeah. <laughs> All right, and, and, and again, I, I think that y y that's just our personalities sometimes, and I think there is no easy answer when we get into a discipline issue. It is difficult. It is going to be painful. It is going to take time. We are going to have to meet with people and counsel with people, and we're going to have to pray over the situation. However, if, if kicking someone out of the church or sending someone home isn't an option, then we are never going to see the kind of success we should. Because, again, that one lump is going to ruin the whole batch of dough, as Paul says in Corinthians. And I have seen it. I have seen where we give someone chance after chance, and while we're giving them chance after chance, they're just sucking people in the school down with them. And then, you know, they're going out and smoking with the guy. And then they're going out to the bar downtown and getting drunk. And then they're, you know, not paying attention in class. And you just see it. When you're really trying to invest and really want to see a Saul of Paul kind of transformation in someone's life and the rest of the corporate body is suffering for the sake of that one person. And, and I remember, uh, it was brought to my mind, a story, I was leading an SBS here many years ago, and it's a nine-month school. So it's, if you can hide sins in a DTS perhaps, you can't really hide it in a nine-month school. It's going to come out eventually. Right? And um, in this one school, we were about four weeks away from the end. And so you're just four weeks away. I'm like, students, just keep it together. I don't care what you do in four weeks. Go crazy. Uh, become an atheist. Not really. I don't mean that. But just, just hold it together for four weeks until you're out of my jurisdiction. Right? And I get a call from campus services. And he says, I need you to come up and we need to sit down in a meeting because we've got a discipline issue. And I'm like, okay. So I go up there, I sit down. He says, one of your students is on the security work duty. And as the security work duty, he's got keys to every room on the campus. And so what he's been doing is he's been going to check on the offices. And when he opens up the office, he'll go in and he's been using all their office computers for pornography. And by that time, the campus had set up the IP tracker, so they knew, they knew that that computer had been used for pornography, and it was at like 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. You know, he was like keeping the keys, and he was supposed to be already off his work duty, but he was going in even later so that there was nobody in the office. And so they kind of basically waited up one night and caught the guy doing this, and it had been going on for a long time using these same computers that are being used for ministry or being used for this horrible pornography at night. And so he said, you know, this is a huge problem on our campus right now. We really are trying, you know, we put the internet filters in, we try to, to do holiness talks, but people are still doing this. And he said, I feel like we need to make an example in this case. I feel like we need to show that we are serious about stopping pornography on our campus computers. And so he said to me, I feel like you should send this kid home. I think you should send him out of the school. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, man, by this time, there's only three weeks left of a nine-month school. Right? Sure, he's blown it. Sure, he made huge mistakes. Right? There's only three weeks left, and he's worked this whole time so hard in SBS, book after book, thousands of charts, whatever, and now three weeks are left and he's not going to graduate. And so the staff and I, we met together and it was just tough. I mean, just praying and you know, not being able to come to a consensus. But eventually, as we were praying and seeking the Lord, we were like, man, we feel like God's saying to send this kid home. I'm like, this is going to be rough, not just for this kid to hear, but the whole school. Because by then, they're so tight. They're so bonded that they're going to, of course, they're probably going to react and they're going to say, no, don't send him home. And so we know that's going to be a cost of us doing this move of discipline. So we sit down with the kid and he was really repentant. You know, he realized he had an addiction. 
he kind of confessed that he'd had this addiction going back to when he was a teenager and that obviously he'd been abusing his security power for a long time to use all these computers because he thought it wouldn't track back to him. And, um, you know, he, he said, I know I need help. Um, I've got this counseling program that I'm, I'm going to look at when I go back home and I just submit myself to your guys' authority. You know, if this is what God is telling you to do. And so we came to the class and it was tough. You know, people were upset at me, of course, as the leader. They were upset at the staff. You know, I mean, it really almost kind of ruined the last three weeks of the school, which should have been a time of celebration. Um, about two years later, I'm doing something, and, uh, and I, I go up to the mail room, and there's a letter. This is back when people still use letters. It's like where you write stuff, and you put it on an envelope, and there's like a stamp, and it can even go like, never mind. So... <laughs> I open up this letter and it's from this kid. It's one of those letters you dream about getting as a school leader, but seldomly get. And it basically was saying, thank you. Thank you for sending me home. He said, all my life, people had just kind of given me grace. They just kind of like, oh, well, it's okay. And he said, I come from a culture in which I'm the only son and only sons can't do any wrong. So my parents really didn't discipline me growing up either. And so I just kept getting away with stuff and getting away with stuff and I didn't deal with this issue. He said, you were the first one who actually forced me to, to walk out the consequences of my sin. It basically was the first one to bring any kind of real discipline into his life. And he said, you know, it was super hard because I had to go home and explain why am I home three weeks early? I mean, everybody knew when I was supposed to be home. And so it was rough. I just had to be honest with people. And, and then I went and I did that counseling program. And he said, God brought healing into my life. I have victory over this area of my life. In fact, I'm involved in a counseling ministry now. And I'm helping other people walk out of addiction in this area. And so I, I want to encourage us. I, I know like, you know, whatever you think of this case, I use this as an example. And it's way more complex than we can cover on both sides of he said and they said. Um, but I just want to encourage us that if we want to achieve what God wants us to achieve, we've got to be willing to discipline ourselves and the people that God puts under us. As a church, we have to take that seriously. It's not always time for grace. It's not always time to just say, oh, that's okay. Sometimes you just have to let people feel the weight of their sin. If Paul says it this way in Corinthians. He's talking about a guy who won't repent. He won't listen to him. They've tried. He says, you are to hand this man over to Satan. Like, Whoa, really, Paul? That's kind of brutal. And what he basically means is put him out of the church. He cannot come back to church until he deals with this sin. Why? So that his flesh and soul may be saved on the day of judgment. That Paul knows the only way that's going to get through to this one guy in the Corinthian church is to kick him out of the church. And then if he repents, then he can come back. And the great thing is in 2 Corinthians, he does that. Paul tells us that the man actually repented and actually says, now you've got to welcome him back in. It was effective discipline in his life. All right, so let's take a break. Uh, let's take our five-minute kind of stretch bathroom break. So we'll come back at around... 20 after and we are to our last key of success we're almost done with Joshua
Okay, so I, uh, I definitely tried to warn you that once we got into this block of Joshua, it was going to be a little on the heavy side. And if you thought that Achan getting stoned to death and whether his children and donkeys and stuff were stoned together and then burnt up was intense, uh, it's only going to get worse. I just want to create the right expectations. It's only going to get worse this hour because we finally have to deal with the issue in Joshua. And no doubt I've taught this book for a long time, Bible studies, uh, and pastoring a church. The main question, the main issue, the main thing that bothers people about the book of Joshua is God's instructions to wipe these people out. And you're like, wow, okay, we can spiritualize Joshua, and we, we're really good at doing that in YWAM. Right? We say, let's go, and we're going to take the land, and we're going to, the walls fall down, and, you know, but then we don't carry that through. And we're going to devote entire cities to destruction and put them all to the edge of the sword. Right? We just spiritualize it so that we sometimes don't have to deal with how brutal this book really is. That when Joshua, the walls fell down and they went into the city, other than Rahab and her family, everyone was put to the sword. And just in case we think, well, maybe everyone's not everyone, blah, blah, blah. It says specifically young and old, women and children. And you may have been struggling with this all the way back to Deuteronomy 7. Just to hold your finger there in Joshua, and we've got to start off there. Because that's where the instructions started. Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting in verse 1, says this. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and clears away the many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites. Does anybody have a name that doesn't have ite at the end of it? The Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mighty than yourselves. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. It's fairly clear. You shall make no covenant with them, show no mercy. What are we in the karate kid? You shall not intermarry with them. God's a racist. Right? <laughs> Giving your daughters, any of you in an interracial marriage right now, you're under judgment. <laughs> Giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Oop, I guess I have to watch out for my daughter. What happens with her? For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you. He would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars, dash them in pieces, their pillars, chop down their asherim, and burn their carved images with fire. Wow. And, and when we read through this, this is a bigger issue. And the bigger issue, uh, uh, how many of you guys in your DTS had a Father Heart of God week? Did you kind of have a, a Father Heart of God week? Okay. Well, one of the things we talk about in the Father Heart of God is what's our God concept? If we were to describe our God, our concept of God with other people, how would we describe Him? Would He be more like Barney? Okay, for those of you who aren't aware who Barney is, um, count yourself as blessed and lucky. Um, Barney is a children's television character. He's a big purple dinosaur. Right? And he's always happy and he's always loving. Right? I love you, you love me, we're one happy family. Right? I have watched so many episodes of Barney right there in building two down there where we first had our children and it was the only, only thing for which my daughter would sit still for. She wouldn't even wear shoes her first three years. She just ran around campus, the art park, everywhere. But for at least a half an hour, she would watch Barney. So I endured torture. I would have rather been waterboarded than watch all those episodes of Barney. But some people's view of God is really like Barney. The whole New Age movement is a Barney God. He doesn't judge. He would never send anyone to hell. And this is the Rob Bell God, universalistic, love wins, no one will endure eternal punishment. That's the message of that book. In case you haven't read it, I just summarized it in two sentences. Now you can read something else. <laughs> That's the Barney God, right? And, and yet some people go to the opposite extreme. And this is where usually the main ministry happens in the Father Heart of God week. 
that for some of us, our view of God is an angry, wrathful God waiting to smite us. The Old Testament King James word for hurt us, discipline us, judge us. And so this kind of image of God striking the earth is something we struggle with because we either did not have a father figure in our lives or we had a father figure in our lives and they were abusive. Physically abusive, verbally abusive, whatever that might be. And as we go into looking at our image of God, we'll bring that father image in. And so we can't help but see God the Father through the light or the lens of our own fathers. Mean, angry, capricious, drunk, whatever it might have been our experience was. And so we, we do this in DTS to try to break this down. However, if you're trying to do this, a lot of times we'll focus on all the passages in which Jesus calls God Abba term of Aramaic endearment or Jesus is having the kids sit on his lap. I can pretty much guarantee you probably don't go to Deuteronomy chapter 7 or the book of Joshua. And I remember um, in leading my first SBS, I just had one of the students come to me when we got to the Old Testament and express like they just wanted to leave the school. They're like, I, I've been fearing this moment. The moment when we would finish the New Testament, because we didn't run chronologically then, we did new and then old. I've been fearing this moment when we go into the Old Testament because I just, I see this Old Testament God and I, it just seems like he's so different from Jesus in the New Testament. He's, he's violent. He's jealous. Uh, there's war. There's violence. He's telling his people to put whole cities to the sword. How, how can I reconcile that with the God of the New Testament? There's this huge divide, she said. And so I really have struggled just to get over my angry God image. That I'm afraid if I spend five months going back through the Old Testament, it's going to come back again. And, and so I had to talk with her about that and talk through, okay, what is a correct understanding of the character and nature of God? If it's not Barney, and if it's not just the angle, angry, wrathful God, what does it look like? And now I have to have that um, same kind of issue with my kids. Because for our kids, how do I describe Old Testament stories? I mean, my three-year-old or my five-year-old or 11-year-old, when they were that age, now my oldest, uh, youngest is 11, how did I explain Noah's Ark? Because what we do in Christianity is make it into a cute story. We literally decorate baby cribs with the story of Noah's Ark. My kids had little people, plastic things, the Noah's Ark set. It's like the little Noah Ark boat and the little people. We have the Ark Park on campus. My kids would go and we'd sit in the Ark and oh, we're the animals in the Ark. Right? It's like this cutesy little story. And then you read Genesis and you're like, oh! The story is a mass death. I, I don't know if you saw the movie that just came out with Russell Crowe, which had very little to do with Genesis, but was entertaining. Um, at least one part of that movie I found to be accurate, or I found to be uh, thought-provoking, and that is actually the scene in which they're first in the ark, and you can hear people screaming outside. And the scene, the big wave crashes up on the rock and people are clinging onto the rock and there's just thousands of bodies floating around them. That's the reality of how God is just, of how God deals with sin and that he would send a flood and destroy everyone and we turn it into baby bumpers because we just don't know what to do with that story otherwise. You can't put that in a little children's Bible. Right? What little picture would you draw? If it was more accurate, the baby bumper cribs Noah theme should look like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Welcome to Noah's Ark. Right? <laughs> That's what it should look like. <laughs> but we're not going to do that, right? So we just, where's the point when we're telling our kids about the character and nature of God or when we're telling ourselves? That we confront the part of God that is just. That is just. Uh, it goes into our missiology. Um, and it goes into our views of history. If there was any topic I can think of out of Joshua that is more relevant 
I don't know what it would be because look what we're dealing with today. How different does what Joshua and the people are doing sound like from the Crusades? I, I mean, it, I am floored sometimes. I remember I was up the hill. There's a big wooden park, and we take the kids up there sometimes to escape if our car could make it up the hill without dying. And we'd go to that little park, and I'd be like uh, hanging out with other parents and uh, trying to share the gospel. And I remember this one guy, his main objection to Christianity was the Crusades. I'm like, really? Come on, you really care that much about what happened in the Crusades? You really feel personal about that? But there's still the church and the Catholic Church, for example, they're still making statements apologizing for them. Because literal armies went in to retake the city of Jerusalem and they slaughtered, not just Muslims, by the way, they slaughtered Jews that were living in the area. And they believed that they were setting up the real kingdom of God on earth. Okay, how different is that from what Joshua is doing? Why can't we do it today? Why doesn't God want us to attack cities anymore and take out idolatry in the same way? Uh, and now you've got ISIS in the news every day. They're trying to establish, again, a new caliphate over this whole area of the Middle East. It's the jihad of Muhammad, again, reborn. And they are, again, serious about it to the point where they're beheading Christians and posting it on the internet. And they're going to establish Sharia law, and they're going to establish a theocracy. One government under Allah, under God. That's what theocracy means. Theo meaning God, and ocracy meaning the form of government. And that's what they're seriously doing. And they're doing it in anticipation of the final judgment. They have a very end times focused belief. How's that different from Christianity? We're always talking about Jesus coming back, and when we say Jesus comes back, he's going to judge people. Those people he, uh, are his enemies. He's going to toss into the lake of fire. Those people who are on his side, the righteous, will go to the new heaven, the new earth. And, and so when we look at what ISIS is doing, they're cutting off people's heads. Well, Samuel the prophet's going to do that in your couple of books away. Right? Saul refuses to chop off Agag's head. He spares his life, and Samuel comes, takes the sword, whack, gets busy, and a guy's head goes rolling. So how's that any different? See, if we don't have answers, we're back in that same problem I talked about yesterday, that Peter challenged us to have a reasonable defense for the hope that we have in Christ. And if you don't have something to say into this, you're going to have a hard time sharing the gospel, particularly in the West right now. Because I guarantee you, they're going to pull up stuff like that. How is Christianity any different? How is your Bible? You say you believe in the Bible, they'll take you right to Deuteronomy 7. They'll take you to Joshua and they'll go, you're just as bad as the Islamic fundamentalists that are wreaking terror and havoc across the Middle East. And this is why we really need to dig into this. This is why we need to really wade through maybe some of our own issues in this. Um, you know, if as we go through it, again, it's going to be detailed, but I wanted to explain first why I think it's important. Okay, so why is this different, this holy war that God is asking them and commanding them to do? Why is it different? Okay, the first way in which it's different from jihad and which is different from the Crusades uh, in this case is that God is the one true God. Now that may seem like a no-brainer. It may seem really basic. However, all of this is based off of God's command. God is the one in Deuteronomy 7 who told them to go into the land. He's the one commanding them to take city after city and devote it to destruction. He is the one true God. Whereas if you look at Islamic Jihad, Allah is not God. And that's not a popular, politically correct thing to say. You're supposed to say, oh, we respect your views. Oh, if your God's name is Allah, and even in missiology, we argue, should we, if we're Christians, should we use the name Allah if we're witnessing? Absolutely not. Never. You'd never call God by the name of another false God. That is never okay. Because we are differentiating. We're saying your God is not the true God. There may be demons telling you what to do or you're telling yourself what to do, but it's not God. 
We worship the one true God. And so that's the first difference. Okay? We have the true God versus their false God. Our true God is telling these people to go to war. Okay? The second important thing about it is that our God is not just the true God, but he's fully just. He's 100% just. And we need to not just look at Deuteronomy 7, we need to go back to Genesis 15. But we talked about Genesis 15 because we said that's where God not only split the animal, cut the covenant with them, but it's also where he gives them the specific land allotments that they're going to have. Now, here's what he says about the timing. Okay, first of all, he says, you're going to go and you're going to be slaves in Egypt for, for 400 years. And during that time, it says, the people will come back after the 400 years. They shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Uh, NIV translation says it this way. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Now, sometimes Amorites has meant a specific people group migrated out of the north. Sihon and Og were their kings. Other times, Amorites is used to talk about all the people of Canaan. So in other words, Canaanite, Amorite can just be a general way to describe all the people who live in this land. So this is extremely important because A, it tells us that God gave them time to repent. While Israel, I mean, because he's giving this to Abraham, while Israel are slaves in Egypt, God gives this whole land 400 years to repent. And you say, well, how did they know to repent? Well, first of all, God had already sent Abraham into the land. God's already sent an emissary who went in and had interactions with kings during the time that Abraham was there. And oh yeah, how about Genesis 14? There's this king called Melchizedek. And he's the king of the city of Jebus, which is the old name for Jerusalem. And Abraham tithes to him. And it says he's a, he's a, king, he's a king who's also a priest, and he's a priest of the Most High God of Yahweh. How did that happen? Like, that's one of those things where, like, really, that's all you're giving us? You're not going to give us some more detail? There's a whole city that are worshiping God, and they're led by a priest king. And we get about 10 verses on it. And then the author of Hebrews will pick it up in the New Testament. You guys just read Hebrews. And he'll compare Jesus to this righteous king and say they were similar. How did he know? How did he even know who the true God is? Abraham hasn't even gotten there yet. Like, he just runs into him. This whole city was worshiping God. And it tells us that we know nothing about what God is doing in the world. Hey, we, we, we really limit God in many ways. God leaves himself a witness. God will reach out to people. Now, it doesn't excuse us to say, oh, don't need missions then. No. Again, he uses his people most often, but who knows who he used to reach this whole city? And what it tells us is that God gave them a chance to repent. And yet, when you looked at Leviticus, it was very clear about what these people were like. They uh, use blood in their worship services. They cut themselves in honor of their gods. They use menstrual blood to dedicate their fields to the gods and ask for fertility. They use sex as part of worship. One god, his name is Molech, requires them to sacrifice their firstborn son. And they would build about a 30-foot wooden statue and the hands of the statue are outstretched of the god Molech. Underneath the hands is a fire pit. And they would build up the fires to extremely high temperatures. And at the end of the ceremony, the king or whoever would take his firstborn baby son and put it into the hands of the statue Molech. And they would all sit there and watch as the baby screamed and burned to death. Okay, these people were evil, evil, evil. Instead of taking that 400 years and using it to repent like Melchizedek did or the people that interacted with Abraham, they only got worse. God is just to judge them. He's fully just to judge them as a people. And so we need to remember that. And so you say, okay, well, what's the difference then between a fear of the Lord and a fear of other gods or demons? 
Uh, when we moved to Taichung, this is our apartment. And right next to us, this is our neighbor's apartment. You see this right here? Looks like a little wooden stove, keep you warm at night. Okay, you don't need a wood stove in Taichung. It never gets that cold. This is their ancestral worship burn pot. And so every morning, our next door neighbor comes out and they toss in the sacred money. And as it burns up, it goes out into the afterlife and it goes to their ancestors. And that's something that she did every single morning. And I thought it was so kind of her to point the smokestack directly to my, um, my little carport area so that every day I wipe her worship off of my moto seat, right? You're like, oh, her worship, right? It was a daily reminder. And as I got to know her and talk to her, it's not that she's doing that because she loved her ancestors. It really wasn't that she loved them. It's this sense of fear that if I don't worship them, if I don't help them, then they won't help me and they will punish me in this life. See, that's what true fear is. And they're gods. They're not predictable. I mean, you go all the way back to the Greek mythology about what gods are like. They just torture people for the fun of it. You know, they just decide, hey, let's mess with this people group. <laughs> right? Hey, let's send this guy on this ridiculous journey and make him accomplish all these great tasks just to entertain us. Hey, that's Hercules and that's Jason and the Argonauts. That's the basic story. The gods are bored. And so they mess with people. And so you fear that kind of a God because you never know what they're going to do to you. You understand that is very different than a fear of the Lord. A fear of the Lord, it comes from an understanding that He is just. He is predictable in that sense, in that He will deal with sin one way or the other. He will either fully judge it, or He can give mercy. And it's up to Him how He decides to do that, but it will be consistent. And see, that's a difference. Like, he, He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He's been just in the Old Testament, he's still just as just in the New Testament. It doesn't change. Right? And, and that fear then, it's not just an awe or reverence. I've heard, heard people talk about the fear of the Lord. Yeah, we just fear the Lord because he's great and he's awesome and he's mighty. Well, sort of. But in the Old Testament, it's also a fear of the Lord because anyone who goes up and they touch Mount Sinai, Right? What happens to them? Like even cows just wander. You know, right? It was a sense of God being just and man being sinful. So we fear the Lord because we know we're sinful and we know that His character is just and we deserve hell. We deserve justice. That's a fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. We also have to remember that this is part of God's whole redemptive plan. See, the end of Islamic Jihad is to take the world for Allah. To take the whole world and to convert everyone to the worship of Allah. Right? That's the goal, to rule the world. What is God's goal? Is God trying to establish a worldwide kingdom here? Is that what God wants? So he wants the Jews to go out and make the Jewish empire. And that was his goal. No. Remember, that's the beauty of seeing God's redemptive plan that you are tracing throughout each book in your assignment. The part of Joshua, why is he taking this land? So that he can have a place to live? No, the heavens can't contain God. Is he doing it so that everyone will know how powerful he is? No. He's doing it because this is the place that he will build a nation that he will bring one man out of who will save the world. Jesus is Jewish, in case you forgot. Jesus was born in this land. If there's no Israel, there's no Jews. If there's no Jews, there's no tribe of Judah. If there's no tribe of Judah, there's no Joseph and Mary. If there's no Joseph and Mary, there is no Jesus. And if there's no Jesus, there's no redemptive plan. So we remember that as God is doing these things and he's clearing the land out, it's because he's creating the vehicle for salvation. That's his end goal, is to send his own son to die on the cross. It's not world domination, it's world redemption. That's God's end game.
So we have to remind ourselves that. And really, even when we look at all these images of the justice of God, most of them we fail to see the mercy of God. Right? Man uh, sins in the garden. Adam and Eve rebel against God. What does God do? He judges them. Pain and childbearing, uh, sweat and toil and weeds, death, kicks them out of the garden. Right? But at the same time, he could have just done away with them. He could have just said, look, I know the future. Every single human is going to make the same exact mistake. They will choose to sin. It's not if, it's when. I'm just, I'm done with it. But he doesn't do that. He takes them out of the garden. He gives them new clothes. He puts a blessing of protection over them. He watches over them. And he lets them be fruitful and multiply and live, which he did not have to do. He warned them. He said, the day you touch this fruit, you'll die. Pretty clear. And there was only one rule. <laughs> you know, just let me write class. One rule on the board. You're like, yeah, I'll break it. Right? It was clear. God could have done away with them and been just. Uh, just a few generations later, what do we read? The whole earth is full of violence. And there's only one righteous man left, Noah. And now if we we're God, we could say, okay, just gave you another couple of hundred years and you're even more evil than you were several chapters ago. I'm just going to wipe you all out. So he sends the flood. But even in that, there's God's mercy. He allows Noah to live and to take his family. And we learn pretty quickly Noah's family is not righteous, are they? Because something really weird happens when they get off the boat. Hey, something really gross, and we try to explain it away. What did Ham do to his dad? He uncovered his nakedness. Um, it, it was wrong, whatever it was. And yet God allows them to repopulate the earth. And then a couple of generations later, what do we find? There's not even one righteous man. Abram is not a righteous man. In Joshua chapter 24, it says, Abram and his father Terah and all their, uh, all their ancestors worshipped idols. Abram was a Gentile idol-loving dude when God encountered him and God changed him and God called him little by little. And we call him the father of faith, but we see a lot of times he wasn't that faithful. And yet God, again, spares his son. He sends the ram. He gives him blessing. He forms the covenant. There's mercy. I mean, the Tower of Babel, same thing. I mean, he could have destroyed them all. And instead, he just scrambles the languages. And even when we get to Israel, and they worship the golden calf, and Moses is up there interceding in Exodus chapter 33, and God's like, I'm done. I'm wiping them all out. And I'm going to restart with you, Moses. Now, if I were Moses, and it's a good thing I'm not, I've been like, yes, do it, Lord, right? And I'll just repopulate this people group, and I won't have any of these people that are a pain in my rear end. And so even in, though there was a plague and thousands of people died, there's still mercy. And Moses interceded, and God heard him. So we, we need to remember there's this bigger plan, this, this bigger theme when it comes to the justice of God. It's heading towards mercy. Right? That's where it's heading. And each, uh, even the Old Testament, there's mercy. Okay, another thing to remember about this situation is that God actually gives them three different options of how to deal with the people in the land. He gives them three different options. Okay, option number one is these people could convert. If they converted, guess what happened to them? They became Israelites. Okay. The moment that they convert, they become Israelites. They're no longer Canaanites to the point where, again, we said that Rahab has a famous descendant. His name is David, who has another famous descendant whose name is Jesus. Right? All from a Canaanite prostitute. And in Matthew chapter 1, rather than gloss over that rather embarrassing ancestor of Jesus's, she is prominently listed. Like, booyah, right there, Rahab, in the line of Jesus. I mean, I might kind of hide that a little bit, but God doesn't. Because Rahab ceased to be a Canaanite. She became God's people. And they all had that choice. A mixed crowd went up out of Egypt with the people of God. You kind of read over that and you're like, 
wow, there were Egyptians who went with Israel. They could always convert. That was always God's highest. Okay, number two. The verb in Hebrew that's used most often is drive out. They could drive out the people. And uh, we can translate that verb dispossess. Okay, so the people could leave. And you think, that doesn't sound much better than killing them. Like take away their homes and force them out. Again, but it was an act of mercy because they deserve justice. They were idol worshipers. They were sacrificing their own kids. They were evil. Again, this is an act still of mercy. And it really is only the last option. If they won't convert, if they won't leave the land, then you're to kill them. And God is fully just to do that. And you say, well, it's not fair. We don't want God to be fair. If he treats us all the same way, we all go to hell. Okay, so if we're like, God, you need to be fair. Okay, go to hell. <laughs> Literally. If he treated us all the same way, but he extends mercy. And when he chooses to show mercy, he chooses to show mercy. And in this case, this was part of his overall merciful redemptive plan. But he's fully authorized, fully just to take these people out. And we have to deal with and embrace that side of the God that we serve. It is important to remember that this is very localized. This is not some huge area. If you, if you don't know the size of Israel, this little kind of comparison shows you how big Israel is in comparison to modern nations. Remember, Islamic Jihad, it spread everywhere. It spread to northern Africa. It tried to take over all of Europe, took over most of the Middle East. It went into Asia. God is only instructing his people to deal with with this small area. I mean, look at it inside the United States. That little blue thing. Look at it inside of India or even France. Not that large of a country. I mean, really, the only country it's kind of close in size with is Taiwan. Outside of this, God was specific in Deuteronomy 20. That's not the people groups you're supposed to wipe out. You offer them peace. Don't take Moab. Don't take Ammon. Don't take Edom. You are not to touch those. So God, it was even a very localized, very specific, because this is all he needed to accomplish that redemptive plan. He's not a sadistic God. But it was worth it in order to bring the Messiah. So I think when you put all of this together, the question, of course, comes about, well, what do we do today? Okay, how do we walk this one out? Well, I think the first thing is, is we do need to be careful that we aren't influenced by the New Age version of God that we don't uh, turn God into just this loving God who would never punish anyone, who has no justice. If we take justice out of the gospel, there is no gospel. Otherwise, what's the good news? If, if God is the God of love and He never judges anyone and we all get to go to heaven, well, I mean, there's no good news. There's no change. There's, nothing, there's no reason Jesus came and died on the cross. There, again, that's what happens when we take the justice of God out. And none of us truly want to live in a world without justice anyway. We want rapists and like people do child pornography just to go around and do whatever they do and not get punished. Nobody wants to live in a world like that, but somehow they want their God to be like that. I, I just I don't understand that mentality sometimes. Right? The other thing that we have to remember um, when we're talking about how do we walk this out is that we are not Israel. Okay? None of us live in a theocracy the last time I checked. This was set up for a theocracy. And no matter what your view is of modern Israel, modern Israel is also not a theocracy. They're not. They're not going to a high priest and casting the Urim and Thummim to decide what they should do in Lebanon or in the West Bank. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right, so it really, the whole system was set up for this theocracy. The second thing we need to remember is what you read in Hebrews. The old covenant is gone. We are reading about commands that were given in the old Mosaic covenant, the Deuteronomic covenant. And Hebrews is pretty clear. Done. It, it's over. And so we're going to have to look at Jesus' teaching 
in the new law that was given in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John for a way that we can navigate through what is a Christian response in these types of circumstances. How did Jesus deal with violence? What did, how did Paul deal with violence? And uh, that's a bigger discussion than we can get into this morning, but we just need to remember those two things. So as we finish Joshua this morning, I don't want to just end on this note of judgment, war, and death, and all those other things. Okay? What I want to end up on today is, uh, I guess you could call it a last key for success. To me, it's just kind of a closing application for the book. And it has to do with the most famous verse that comes out of Joshua. Right? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I, I kind of thought this was interesting because they used it right over their television set. I don't know if that's like a prophetic statement, right? Is that a prophetic statement of what they're going to watch on TV? Or is it just like God's like, really? Uh, that's not very honoring to put my words over your TV set, your flat screen TV. Take it as you will. But anyway, what it expresses, though, is Joshua's heart. That at 110 years old, he could have just ridden off into the sunset. He's done enough work. He was 40 years a slave in Egypt. He was 40 years trying to shepherd a very rebellious generation, his generation in the wilderness. Then he spent five years leading a military campaign that was difficult and, you know, stressful. And, you know, I mean, it was just full of stuff. And by the end of that, he's 85. Now, when I'm 85, I'm heading to Florida. I don't know about you or somewhere else. Bali, I mean, whatever you want to say, and I'm retiring, right? That's our mentality.